Amen. Amen. Well, welcome everybody. How you doing today? Great. All right. Good. Praise the Lord, man. Uh, what a great start to our message, just being able to honor and worship God by singing from our whole heart. And I love that song so much because isn't that need to be, doesn't that need to be our prayer? You know, God, call me out of my comfort zone. Call me to this next level. Call me to this place where I can't do it on my own. And I think for some here, let that even be a word in your spirit, in your life right now, because we like to operate in our place of safety and security, but that is not where God is going to move you. He's going to move you to a place where you desperately need him, where you can't do it on your own because his vision for your life is that big and that grand and that great, but you have to have the courage to step out of the boat. See, you have to have the courage to take that next step, and I think God has planted you here in this place, in this church, to take that step. To be in a place where you're safe enough that you know that if, even if you begin to go down, that God's going to rescue you. He's going to save you. He's going to reach out his hand. And he's going to lift you up. See, he's going to do something in your life this year. I totally believe it. And I believe that he's brought you here for this season, this time, right now. To make that decision in your mind where you just surrender it all to him. In fact, we're going to be talking about that today. We're going to be talking about what it looks like in our life to live a life of surrender. Before I get to that, let me remind you of what this entire sermon series has been about. 3D vision. What we've been looking at is who we are at the Place Church. I mean, what is our vision statement? Where do we see this faith community going? And I know for some of you, you just recently started coming. And what a wonderful time for you to be here. As you're sitting in that chair thinking to yourself, ah, is this a church I really want to be part of? Well, you're going to know at the end of today where we're going and who we are. And so you're going to be able to make a, a, good, a good, knowledgeable answer to that question, right? You're going to be able to say yes or no. But let me start with who we are. What's that vision statement? Now, we've talked about it the last couple days, or a couple weeks, but let me share with you what it is. The Place Church is a family of forgiven people made whole in Christ to proclaim and model his kingdom through faith, through hope, and through love. So that's our vision statement. And then we talked about how do we do that. That comes to mission. Now we have a 3D mission. Who remembers the first D in our 3D mission? Great, great. He's like, I got the second one, man. I'm ready. I'm ready, cock locked, and ready to rock. I got number two, but I can't remember number one. What's number one? Declare, right? Declare God's goodness to our community. De declare, right? No, it's not. Jesus, come on, guys. <laughs> All right, here's what it is. Demonstrate God's love to our community. Middle one, number two. Disciple people into fully developed followers of Jesus. And then what's the last one? Declare. Declare God's kingdom to this world. Exactly right. So we demonstrate, we disciple, and we declare. And then we said, okay, so that's our mission. That's where we're going. But what about us, our DNA, who we are? And we said in order to, to know who we are when someone comes in here, that we have to have core values. values. Exactly right. That's what we started talking about last week. And we said core values are so important here at the Place Church because what they do, they become principles. Principles that guide our internal conduct as well as the relationship that we have with the external community. See, the core values begin to define how we treat one another. See, core values are going to say that. If I, if I value something, that's how I'm going to treat you. But then those that aren't part of this faith community are going to look at our lives and see what we value. And that will begin to define our faith community. So last week I talked about two core values. Who remembers the first core value I talked about last week? Honesty. Honesty. All right. Good. It's all like Donkey Kong when it comes to last week. I feel good about that. We are not afraid to have uncomfortable conversations at the place church. And we, in the heart of, and, and breath of one another, we have to be willing to have difficult conversations and be honest with one another. So honesty is a value. And then what was the second one we talked about last week? Laughter. Everyone knew that one. Yeah, laughter. We say laughter is great medicine, and we're going to do it a lot. That's something that's very important to us, laughter. We believe that Jesus laughed, right? 
People wanted to follow Jesus because of what he exuded and how he lived life. God has given us a lot to be joyful about. And as a faith community, laughter and joy needs to be part of who we are. Now let's start today's message with a question. And my question, I'm going to give you the opportunity to answer. And here's the question I'm going to start with today. Why is it sometimes difficult to live a generous life? Okay, why is it sometimes difficult to live a generous life? I heard selfishness. Okay, sometimes we can be selfish. Fear. What else? Fear. Fear. Good. Fear. I got to be safe and secure. What else? We're trying to make it ourselves. We're just trying to make it ourselves. We're trying to keep our head above water. How am I going to live a generous life? What else? Ashamed. Ashamed. Shame can stop us from living a life of generosity. What else? Greed. We're, we're greedy. We feel like we have nothing to give. And can I get one more? Lack of faith. Lack of faith. Lack of faith. Well, if I live a generous life, what if God doesn't provide for me? Well, three of our values are linked with generosity. And we're going to be looking at three core values today linked to this idea of generosity. And the first one I want to look at today is this value right here. We live to give. Let's say that aloud. We, we live, live to give. We live to give. And so when we look at this value in, in our lives, we say, where does that come from? How do we come to the place in our lives where we choose to live to give? And I think it's because of our relationship with God. Because when we look at God, we look at the most generous example that we can ever think about. I mean, God's generosity, he gave his one and only son so that you and I could have a life and life eternal. John 3.16, probably the most famous New Testament Bible verse around, says this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you see that? God gave his only son. When we look at generosity and we look at God, God freely gave. Generosity was part of who he was. And I imagine when we hear that, I mean, it's, I mean, we kind of get it, but I really don't think sometimes we really understand how generous that was for you and for me. Let me put it in terms that maybe make better sense. Imagine an individual who did a heinous crime, went to court, was found guilty, and today sits on death row. He's awaiting the time that he is going to be punished for his crimes. He is going to be killed because of what he has done. And he went to court and he deserves what he's going to get. And he's sitting there awaiting his time. Somebody who has done no crime at all, who didn't do the crime deserving death, in fact, not, not only didn't do that crime, didn't do any crime at all, sees this individual sitting on death row. And he looks to him and says, I will take your punishment. I will go to the electric chair. I will go to the death chamber and you can go free. Now, we hear that and we say, but that isn't fair, right? What he did, he deserves to die. But what you have to know is you were the one sitting in death row. Right. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says because of the sin in your life that you were deserving of death, that you were deserving of eternal separation from God. But God in his great love sent his one and only son to step in, to intervene, to take the punishment that you deserve. That is why the cross at Calvary is so important to you and so important to me because that's where you deserve to be. Right. That's what you deserve to go for. You deserve that punishment that we see when we watch that movie, Passion of the Christ. That should have been you that was getting whipped. That should have been you that was hanging out on the cross. But it wasn't. Because Jesus stepped in and said, I will take their punishment upon myself. 
And he took that punishment so that you and I didn't have to. And we could enter into a relationship with God. See, that's what John 3.16 is all about. For God so loved the world. And when Jesus came, he came into a world that wasn't expecting this kind of grace or this kind of love. In fact, he stepped into a world where they expected sulfur and fire. Not a son and a sacrifice. They expected the judgment of God, but God brought his mercy into our lives. See, that's what he did when he gave. That word in the Bible means to give. It means to grant. And it's not the only place that we find it. We also find it later on as Paul writes a letter to Titus. The book is Titus chapter 2 verse 14. We read about what Jesus did in this moment. Here's what it says. Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself. That's what I just described right there. That's that action, stepping into death row, setting you free, allowing you to live a, a right life because of him. That's what I just described. But then look at the end of that verse. Check it out. Here's what it says. Purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. I love that. You know, if we were to look at that and sort of uh, in, in a different way, take like the actual meaning of these different words for that last part, we could say it says this. We become God's possession and are on fire to live a life of good Moral standing and action. Man, I love that. We become God's possession and are on fire to live a different life. I want to ask you, what about, what about you? Does that describe you? Does that describe your life? Are you a person that is just on fire to live, to do what God wants you to do? To discover the call and just to run after it. Are you a person that's on fire? Because I believe probably I'm sitting in a room where people remember that fire. You remember that moment when you started following Jesus, when he stepped into your darkness and brought you and put you in a place of wonderful light, where you woke up in the morning with a passion and with a prayer that said, God, I'll do whatever you want to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. You remember that day. Where did it go? What happened to that fire? What happened to that reckless abandon in your life? To say, whatever, God, it's all about you. See, that's the place where we want to be. And listen, if you're here and you remember that day, but you're not living that day, I just want you to know that it's not too late. I want you to know that God brought you here to this place right now to say, you know what? This is the life that I want to live. I'm going to forget about all these distractions that are pulling me away from God's perfect plan for my life. And I'm going, to, I'm going to focus because I want to be on fire to live this life that God has for me. Now, let me tell you, I know that there are some right now that may be having a hard time with this last part that says to live a life of good moral standing and action. Because you look and say, no, it's all about God. It's all about Jesus. And I want you to know, I agree with you 100%. It's all about him and his grace. There's this wonderful moment in the Protestant Reformation where people at one time began to work and work and say, God, I'm going to do this for you and that for you, and I'm going to earn this and I'm going to earn that. And then the Protestant Reformation happened and it shifted and changed everything. And they came up with a thing called the five solas, the five solas. And these are the five solas right here. And here's what it, it, it says. It says, sola gratia, sola fide, sola Christus, sola scriptura, soli deo gloria. I practiced that. Come on, give me a little bit. <laughs> but here's what it means. It means saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. And we have to hold on to that with white knuckles, that it's nothing that we did. It's everything that he did. 
But when he steps into our life and changes us, we become different people. We're not the same people. He places on the inside of us a fire for him, a fire for righteousness, a fire to follow after him, a fire to live for him. Amen. And that fire needs to be translated into how we live, how we treat our kids, how we treat our neighbors, how we treat our enemy, enemies. People should be able to look at you and say, man, there's something different about this dude. Man, there's something different about him. I don't know what it is, but he's not the same guy that I remember from last week. Right. There's a change that happens on the inside of you. That's that fire. You gotta figure out well, what, what does that look like? Because when that fire begins to come, it affects how you live your life. You wake up in the morning with a different mindset. I met this guy this week, he's a gold digger. I don't mean like Kanye West gold digger. You know what I mean? I'm not saying that kind of gold digger. I mean he's like a literal gold digger. And he goes out and he's searching for gold. Now, he was telling me, though, about this really cool machine that he has. It's kind of like a, a metal detector, but it's pretty fancy. And it specifically can find gold. And he talked about how when he takes this machine out, he finds an area that is believed to have some gold. And he takes this machine out, and he plots the land that he wants to see. And he takes the machine, and he just begins to scour that land. Right? He'll begin to walk and move it back and forth. And there may be a, a long season where he doesn't hear anything. But every now and then, he comes to a place. I don't know if that's what it actually sounds like, but in my mind, that's probably like what it is. Or maybe it's just like, cha-ching. I don't know, that would be a cool sound effect, like, cha-ching. And so he, he, sets, he sets the thing, right now when that happens, when he's alerted, watch this, when he's alerted that there's something of value there, he sets the machine down, he gets his shovel, his bobcat, his hands, I don't know what he does, but he goes down and he just begins to dig in the dirt because he knows there's something of value there. And he digs until he finds it because he knows there's something of value there. This life that we discuss about living a life on fire for God, you begin to live your life this way. You begin to live your life with the Holy Spirit leading and guiding you everywhere you go. And there's going to be moments and times when as you're going through your life, you're having this conversation, you're speaking with someone, they're speaking to you, and you just hear this thing. Cha-ching. <laughs> right? It happens. And, and the Holy Spirit allows you to recognize that this moment is a God moment. Amen. That something is taking place in this time where you are to be part of. That he has placed you there in this moment right now to be part of this situation. And when you notice that, now you have to get engaged. Now you take your agenda, your plans, you set them on the back and you say, all right, God, what are we doing here? This is what you want me to do. What are we doing here? See, God wants to do this in your life. Do you believe that? Amen. Yeah. You want that. I believe so many of you, you desperately want God to be. So, so why don't you begin today? Why don't you just begin to receive that word that I just said and say, God, I want that in my life. Now be careful. It's a dangerous prayer. Because when he begins to do it, now he's going to expect you to act on it. Now when he begin, when you begin to hear, he's going to be like, all right, now, now what are you going to do? How are you going to respond? How are you going to move in this? But if you do, maybe right now, pray that prayer. Dangerous prayer, but a powerful prayer that will change everything about how you live day to day. Because we live to what? Yeah. <laughs> Which I don't want to get, all right? <laughs> Pretend I didn't do it. Just surprise me. <laughs> because we live to what? Yeah. yeah. That's right. We live to give, right? It's a value. That's a core value. And who we are. Now, let me give you another core value. This is a core value number two for today. And that's simply this. If we don't, it won't. Say that. If we don't, it won't. If we don't, it won't. We cannot be a people here at the Place Church that are waiting for somebody else to do it. Right? If we see a problem, we see a need, we need to be the people that are responding to that. 
I see a need, so I'm going to be part of the solution, not complain about the problem. Many churches are filled with people that are experts at complaining about problems. Amen? Amen. Some of us have been there. We know what that's like. That will not be the place, church. Because we are people of action. And so when we see something, when we see a need, we're going to respond. You know, I, had, I used a great example in, in the parking lot a couple months ago where, you know, there was trash or something in the parking lot and, you know, someone came and they walked right past the trash, came in the building. I'm like, what are you doing? Well, I didn't put it there. I know, what are you doing? Right? Am I talking to my seven-year-old son? Come on, man. And, and that, but it became this great learning moment where we're able to say, no, if I see something, I'm going to respond to that thing because this is my house too. And I want you to think about that. You know, remember, this is just a building. This is not a church. Where's the church? Here. Exactly. You're the church, right? You're the church. When you leave here, it's a building. When you come back, it's a church. And it's only a church because you're in it, right? So we begin to take ownership and say, you know what? This is my family. I'm going to value the relationships that I have. This is my house. I'm going to be able to watch over it. If there's something here, because we're in this thing together. We're not going to look and say, it's his job, it's her job, it's their job. No, we're going to respond and say, it's my job. I'm going to become part of the solution. And it's funny because this, this value has been part of who we are. And you actually are, are, are reaping the consequences of this value lived out in this church body. Because you're sitting right here in this building, this building right here, you're sitting here. And you wouldn't be sitting here right now if people didn't respond to this. Because there was a season and a time when we had no home. We were renting out, it was coming to an end. We were heading in one direction, everything fell through. But now we're sitting in this place right now because people said, you know what? We need a home. They came together, we collected money as a church body. We were able to purchase this building right here. I didn't say mortgage, I said purchase. <laughs> and walk through that door and say, this is now the building where the church is going to gather, yeah. right? So you are, are reaping that consequence right now. Here's what I want you to know. In five years, what will those people that aren't here now, but they're coming, Right? What will those people be reaping because of your adherence to this value in this church body? Right. See, because I believe that God wants to use you for those folks that are going to be reached in five years. They're not even here. They haven't even heard about the place. Or some of them haven't even moved to Wickenburg. But he's going to be, use you in this season to prepare this ministry for those folks if we begin to live by this value. If we don't, it won't. One of the easiest ways to begin this process is what we've placed in action called the SPARK assessment. Now, the SPARK assessment is basically just looking at where you are in life, what are your passions, abilities, skills, taking that list and partnering you in an area here at the ministry that's a great fit for you, a place where you want to be, a place where you're, you're happy to be there. That SPARK assessment has worked great. Now, we have a goal by January 1, how many people do we want to get processed through the SPARK assessment? 100. 100. Which some people look at me and say, that is an awfully lofty goal. I said, welcome to my world. <laughs> right? I believe it can happen. Right now we have 44 people in process. 44 people are somewhere in this, in this process right here going through the SPARK assessment. Now, if you're here and you're not one of those 44, I want to ask you why not? <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to lift up your hands because God knows. <laughs> I'm the pastor, man. I'm going to bring it if I got to, right? <laughs> but when we live out the value, it affects what we do. When we live out the value, and that's, that's the important part. We can sit here and say we have these values all day long, but are we living these values out? Now, I had someone come up to me even before this service, and they're like, hey, man, I love to do the SPARK assessment, but hey, I'm balancing four jobs now, and I got this, and I got that. And I said, listen, that's not what the SPARK assessment is about. Because what the SPARK assessment does is it takes those gifts, talents, and abilities and puts you in this place where now we can search 
via those gifts, skill and, skills, talents, and abilities. Skills. Yeah. <laughs> skills. I'm hungry. Um, but, but we can search by that, and then we can plug people into the right area. I just had that this week. We're working on a brand new website for you guys, and it's been a lot of fun. And I was able to go through, because of the folks that have filled out the Spark assessment, I was able to look up someone who had a passion and a knowledge and understanding of website design. I was able to call them up and say, hey, we're doing a, a new website. Would you mind just looking at it and maybe helping us with the process? He said, I'd love to. See what I mean? Like that kind of specificity, we would not be able to have if it wasn't for the Spark Assessment. So here's what I want to challenge you to do. If you're one of the few that haven't done the Spark Assessment yet, I want to challenge you this week, even today, to get on and do the Spark Assessment. Now the way it works is you fill it out and someone will just give you a call and they'll let you have a conversation with you and they'll try to park you in a place that's going to be a great fit for you. That's, that's the whole goal. That's all it's about. It'd probably take you about 10 minutes, 10 minutes to do this. So hopefully next week I can stand in front of you and say, man, we just doubled our numbers. We went from 44 to 88. And that was just for a service, right? <laughs> I can say something like, like that next week. Take that step. And again, remember, it's not about what we, what's happening on a Sunday morning. It's about how what we do here, what we learn here affects our Monday nights our Wednesday afternoons, our Friday evenings, you know, that's what's important. What are you taking away and what are you doing with what you're learning here? And I know some folks may be sitting here and, and you're not a full-time Wickenburg resident. You're what some would call a snowbird, right? But what I would affectionately call our winter guests. Let's welcome our winter guests here. We love you. We love you. We look forward to you coming and being part of our wonderful community of Wickenburg, your wonderful community of Wickenburg, and I know you're here. And my question to you, though, today, being here, is what is the attitude when you come to Wickenburg? Because sometimes this is vacation time, right? This is a time to escape the cold weather. But I want to encourage you this winter to look at your time here as God's ordained mission. For your life. That God has you here in this community specifically for a reason. Amen. To get plugged in here and to shine bright for him this winter in Wickenburg through the place church. Now I look forward, all of our snowbirds, our winter guests, they, they swoop on in and I look forward to seeing them each and every single year. A couple of my favorites are a couple uh, that come from snowy Colorado and they come here to Wickenburg, Arizona every year. And they've been part of the Place Church for the last few years and I just have so much joy uh, when they come and I just wanted them to take a minute just to share with you their experience here. Will you guys give it up for Toby and Andrea Walker? <laughs>
for the live stream and the uploaded for sermons on Facebook or YouTube. And when we are states away, I just love how technically advanced and up with the technology that that the place is. It's very awesome. And um, I got to tell you, last Sunday was a, quite of a blessing. It was, I went to last uh, second service, and uh, I was welcomed home by a lot of people. And it was quite, quite a blessing in my heart. Um, with such loving, accepting people, uh, I enjoy opportunities to get more involved. I am excited about the SPARK program, as uh, Greg mentioned earlier. We fill those out today. <laughs> <laughs> 46. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're a snowbird or a resident, that's a, it sounds like a great opportunity to get involved and um, check it out because it's not something you have to do, it's something you get to do. Think about that. You get to do it. It's pretty cool. Getting involved. And um, I love how involved the place is with the community and how many opportunities they offer to join in and, and they help set up plays and Go to the go to the um, Franklin Graham uh, in Phoenix last year. That was pretty awesome. So I remember most recently uh, was helping with the Awesome Fest. I got to put wristbands on little kids, little princesses and goblins and ninjas and you know, all that other stuff. I actually even got to take my picture with an evil princess and Donald Trump. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm not voting for the evil princess. <laughs> <laughs> Getting involved and being a part of your community that you live here. Now, you're a part. And be, a, be, be blessed. Let it, let it be a blessing to you because you're a blessing to very many more people. Just, you don't even know it. Just um, get out there and be blessed because if we don't, we won't. Okay, all right. <laughs> Oh man, you know it's so nice, and I know probably there's so many other stories, other people that are out there, and, and you know what it's like to come back to Wickenburg, and we want you to know that this is home. When, when our winter guests come back, first things I say to them, I say, welcome home, right? This is home. This, this is not, when you come back, listen, this is home. We're glad to have you. So this is your house. This is your home. Let's get plugged in and really start making a difference because when we join together, let me tell you, great things are able to happen. When we as a faith community begin to stand up and say, you know what, if I don't, it won't. I want to be part. How can I get plugged in this year? I only got one last one for you, one last value that we have here at The Place Church, and that's this. Selflessness. It's not about me. Right? Selflessness. It's not about me. It's not about me, right? I think that that's so important. In the book of Philippians, we read a letter from Paul to the church in Philippi. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, I want you to hear his description, Paul's description to this church, because I think it's really applicable to our lives, too, at the church here in Wickenburg, Arizona. He said this, he said, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. I love how the Message Bible does verse 5 of Philippians chapter 2. It reads like this. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. Think about those words. Think of yourself. You know, being a Christian literally means this, that you are called to be Christ-like, which means we look at the life of Jesus, how Jesus lived, and we say, I want my life to look like that. 
Our lives as Christians, as believers, they should reflect <coughs> Jesus. So much should be able to look at our lives and see the way that we act, the way that we treat people, the way that we live, the way that we honor God, and say, wow, that looks a lot like Jesus. And then Paul, in this letter, talks a little bit about what made Jesus, did, what, like how did he live, what did he do? And I love what Paul said because he said, Jesus emptied himself. He emptied himself. Now, I want you to think about your life right now. Does that describe you? you know, when I think about God and his goodness and in my life, and I look at the life of God, and I see you know, God is just filled with goodness and blessings, right? I mean, when we think of God, we think of how full he is with everything that we want. And I remember when I, when I came to, to Christ, man, I was... Well, I had a little bit in me. <laughs> but it wasn't much, man. I mean, I was just kind of empty. And uh, I came to God who was so full. And, you know, that's what humility is. So I had to humble myself and I come and, and believe. You know, the Bible says, humble yourselves before the Lord. And God came into my, my empty life, right? And he decided to just pour himself into it. It's a beautiful thing. You know, he just began to pour and pour. <laughs> He's a little slow. <laughs> but uh, it's, it still works out real well. He poured and poured and poured and poured and poured and poured. So you guys, the OCE are, you know, right now. You know? But he filled me up. I mean, he filled me up. God is so good to me. And he just filled up my life. And see, some of you are sitting here today, and this is your life. When you look at the blessings that God has poured in and your life is just so full, he has just been so good to you. And, and you look at that and, and, and we're happy. Like, man, praise God for all that God's done, all that he's forgiven, you know, the hope and life, the passion, everything that I'm able to have now because of him. But the problem I see sometimes is with the church or those that are following after Jesus, like they're really happy and, and God is really generous. And so what God does, I mean, he sees this life, your life, that is full. It's filled with the blessings of God, but God just can't help himself. You're a couple. <laughs> <laughs> he just looks and he's like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to continue to pour. And he just keeps yeah. pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring. And then we look at some of the blessings that God has, has poured into our life. What ends up happening to them? They just, they just fall on the ground, right? Because... See, this isn't the way that God designed us to live. He didn't design us to take these blessings and allow these blessings just to overflow and just fall on the ground. That, that wasn't the purpose. You see, the purpose of God in your life is to take what he's poured into your life and to find other empty vessels. Amen. And you begin to pour your life into these empty vessels until the place where you empty yourself. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, guess what? You know how to get filled back up. There's so many that don't know how to get filled back up. Our role on this earth is to find those who are empty and pour into their lives an overflow of what God has poured into our lives. Amen. See, Jesus emptied himself. This place where you are right here is a great opportunity for you to empty yourself into the lives of others. I want you to ask yourself, maybe even this week, you say, you know what? I'm going to begin to pour out these blessings that God has given me. I'm going to begin to take this life and say, you know what? I want it to be used. I want my life to be used by God. I want to empty my life for his glory. And the last one is this. Not only did he empty himself, but he was obedient, the Bible says, even to the point of death, even death on a cross. You know, Jesus, it says he was in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he was taken away to be persecuted and to be killed. And he's praying a prayer. It's a powerful prayer. And he's there before God. And he, he looks to God and he prays these words. He prays these words. He says, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. And then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. What a powerful moment where Jesus said, God, it's not about me, it's all about you. To be a Christian means to be Christ-like, okay? It's a great example for our lives. He said, it's not about me, not my will, God, but yours. 
Jesus obeyed God to his very death. Now, here's what I want to ask you. What are you holding back? See, Jesus took his life and just laid it out before God and said, God, it's not about me. It's all about you. But I find sometimes in our lives, you know what we do? We live our lives like this. There's things that we're holding on to. Where God would look at you and say, no, you're here to sacrifice it all to me. Give it all to me. It's all about me. And we're like, oh, I can't give you this. Now, what is this? Like, it's different for all of us. I mean, maybe you're sitting in the this for you. Maybe it's just an unholy relationship that you're in. Maybe it's secrets that you don't want anyone to know. But the reality is, is that these secrets keep you sick. And you find yourself in the same cycle, but you just hold on to it. You won't surrender it over to God. Maybe for some of us, it's just honesty. We just put on a mask. We just are living this lie. We pretend like it's all good, but really it's not. We're holding this thing away from God. We haven't surrendered that to him. Maybe it's addiction or something else. You know it for your life. In fact, even as I'm describing these in your mind, something came up. That thing right now, that thing that popped up, that's what I'm talking about. And Jesus would look into your life and say, you know what? You need to surrender this. You need to surrender this to God. He said, I can't surrender this to God. He says, what are you serious? You got nowhere else to go. This thing is holding you captive. This thing is keeping you in prison. This thing is stopping the fullness of joy in your life. But yet, you won't surrender to God. But God brought you to this place right now to take a step and surrender. Everyone that walked through those doors this morning, you got a bag of tissues or a little package of tissues. Grab, grab those tissues with you right now. You thought I was going to make you cry, but I didn't. <laughs> but I do want you to grab those. And I want you to open up those tissues. And I want you to pull, I want you to pull out one tissue. And if your neighbor doesn't have a tissue, I want you to just give, give them one. I want everyone just to have a tissue in your right hand. Everyone, a tissue in your right hand. I know some of you guys are like, I ain't going to do it. Come on, man. Just play it on. Just do it. Don't right? be like that. Don't be that guy. All right. Come on, wave in there like you just don't care. All right, all right. Yeah. We should do this for worship, man. That would be awesome. We're all like doing flag dances and stuff with our tissues. People are walking in like, what? This church is weird. All right. <laughs> now, there's been this interesting thing throughout history, especially when it comes to wars or fighting or anything else, and that was the power of the white flag, right? And the white flag has a universal meaning, and it's been this way for centuries. I mean, you can go all the way back, and the white flag traditionally has meant what? Surrender. Surrender, Surrender. exactly right. Now, you have in your hand, in your right hand, this, this white tissue, which we're going to represent a flag, okay? Now, in your left hand, I want you to take that thing, right? That thing that you're holding on to. That thing that you're not opening up, being honest, that thing you're not talking to anyone about, that thing that's keeping you pushed down, that thing that's holding you captive, that thing that steals your joy, that thing that popped in your head when I started talking about that thing. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. And I want you to bow your head with me right now. And I want you to think about these two hands that you have, one with that thing that is holding you down, that thing that God is calling you to surrender. And then I want you to think about this, this white flag in your right hand. And I want you to really consider how you want your future to be. How do you want your tomorrows to be, your next week, your next month? Your next, do you want to continue to carry this, this heavy load on your back? Or are you willing and are you ready to surrender? Are you willing and are you ready to give this thing over to God, to invite him into the midst of it. Are you ready to surrender? And in this moment, I just want you to consider that question in your heart, and I'm going to pray for you. Lord, I pray for each and every single person. Holy Spirit, I pray that you move in the hearts and the lives of people. Our prayer for this service this day is that this will be a defining moment. That this will be a time when people can look back and say, my life was never the same after this moment. That they'll be able to look back and say, this was the day of surrender. This was the day that I got real with Jesus. This was the day that I gave it all to him. 
This is the day that everything in my life changed. That's our prayer for this moment right now, Lord. I pray that you give courage to your children right now. Give courage to your sons and your daughters to be humble before you and to say, it's not about me. It's all about you. And now with your, your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you would say, man, that's, that's me. I need to surrender this to God. Here's, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to, if that's you, you say, I'm ready to surrender. With your right hand, I just want you to lift up your white flag. Just lift up your white flag and say, I'm ready to surrender this. And then with your left hand, I just want you to open up, open up that left hand, that thing. I want you to picture in your mind just God taking that thing from you as you're surrendering it to him. That heaviness, that hurt, that anger, that bitterness, that shame, all of that is taking that away from you and saying no more because as you live a life of surrender, as you daily give it all over to him, he takes that heaviness from you and he exchanges it and he pours into your life grace, mercy, love, wholeness, forgiveness, everything that you need to live a life that God has for you. Father, I want to pray for each and every single person today that surrendered to you, surrendered something to you, raised the white flag before you. I pray for them, and I thank you for each and every single one of them. I pray that they live in victory from this day forward. But now, with every hand down, I know that there's some that are here today, and you're hearing the good news about Jesus, the plan that he has for your life, maybe for the first time. You're sitting here, and you've never surrendered your heart in your life. To Jesus. You've never given him your todays and your tomorrows. And so in this moment, you're ready to follow after him. The Bible says that you turn away from wickedness. You turn away from that which is wrong and you run towards God. That you believe in your heart that Jesus lived, died, and rose again. And if that's you right now, I want to say a prayer with you right where you are in your seat. If you're here and say, I'm ready to surrender my heart and my life to Jesus, I am ready to give it all to him. I am ready to cross from death to life, from darkness to light. In this moment, if that's you, I want to say a prayer with you. So if you say, I'm ready to surrender my heart and my life to Jesus, I'm ready to give it all. I'm ready to be a Christian and follow after God. I just want you to lift your hand up on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Lift it up high. I see you. I see you. I see you. Who else would say yes to Jesus today? I see hands all over this place. We're going to pray with those that lifted their hands and those that have already prayed this prayer. Speak these words out loud, loud enough so that you can hear it. Say, Jesus, Jesus I, surrender I surrender my life to you. Life to it's you. not about me. It's, about it's all, about you. all about you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. for my sin, for my, for my mistakes, mistakes, for the things that I've done in my life. But I give it all to you. And I believe that you forgive me that you love me, that you will never leave me, and never forsake me. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This is your moment from darkness to light. Will you guys give it all up for all those saying to surrender? Amen.